Hey, there we go. Seven figures on Kickstarter. Welcome, everyone, to this presentation. Thank you for being here. Um, what we'll do is go over a quick presentation, 25, 30 minutes, and then we will spend maybe 10 minutes or so answering your questions here at the front of the microphone. So when we get to that point, feel free to come up and ask your questions. I'll do my best to answer them. So this, uh, on the program, this was titled Making or Running a Six-Figure Kickstarter. Um, I copied and I was really lazy and copied and pasted this from another presentation, so it still says seven figures. Um, but essentially, it, it, over the, the duration of this journey that we'll look at, you will see that seven figures on Kickstarter is possible. Obviously, that begins with smaller numbers. Um, and when I started this, uh, I had the presentation ready to go, and I looked at it today, this morning, in preparation for the talk, and I realized I wasn't really happy with it. It was kind of like, you know, a, a brief overview of a bunch of stuff that I think is very useful for people when they're thinking of running Kickstarters. But it was very generic as well, so this morning I ended up deciding to delete it because I hated it, <laughs> which probably wasn't the best idea just before you're we about to give the presentation. So this thing was thrown together fairly quickly, um, but I still think it's much better because I feel it delivers more value and gives you a bunch of actions and things that you can take away right away. You can start instantly if you haven't done so already. Whether you've run a Kickstarter before or you've run, uh, you haven't run any Kickstarters, right? So without further ado, yep, six figures. It seems like a big goal, right? Seven figures, six figures, but at the end of the day, it all starts with one dollar. And anyone who's launched a novel or a series of novels already knows that, right? You, you maybe want to become a full-time author or whatever, but it all begins somewhere. And we either think about, you know, the big numbers are nice, six figures and seven figures sounds awesome, but it begins with one dollar, and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, you can't get around the fact that you have to begin with a much, much smaller number. So that's something I want to talk about, and I'll, I'll come back to you a few times, um, because the strategy I've used to raise seven figures over the first two years of my career in Kickstarter that was the, one of the core principles that I, I followed. So who wants to run a six-figure Kickstarter? Awesome. Nearly everybody. Good. I'm glad you're here then. <laughs> you're in the right place. Um, who's run a Kickstarter before? Right. Roughly half of you, maybe a little more. And how many people have run more than one Kickstarter? Cool, still, still quite a few people. Awesome, so we have a, a nice mix of people who are maybe too new to Kickstarter and some people who are more experienced. Right. Paddy Finn, that's my name. Why should you listen to me? Who am I? Um, I'll be very brief, you don't need to hear all this. But essentially, I was born in Northern Ireland, in, in case you didn't guess from the Irish brogue. Um, so I was born in Northern Ireland in the 80s, and I grew up in a time uh, called the Troubles, it's kind of like a time of civil war. And I was kind of born into the middle of that. And my father, um, he was a member of the IRA. He spent most of my childhood in prison. Uh, so we didn't really have a great start in life and had a lot of challenges to overcome to sort of become, you know, to get to where we are now. Uh, so the journey, eventually, I did IT for 15 years and it was kind of soul destroying because I was stuck in the office day in, day out. And I decided one day, I don't want to keep paying someone else's mortgage, paying for someone else's yacht, building someone else's company. I wanted to do that for myself and my family, and later on, my fans and followers and whatnot. So in 2016, I decided to write science fiction and fantasy. I started with science fiction because I thought, fantasy is really difficult, and the language is very specific. And then I, I went into science fiction and was like, OK, this is just as hard. What was I thinking? Um, but eventually, you know, I, I wrote both. Um, started out, I hadn't written books before, but I'd always had a love of writing. Just a similar story to everyone here, right? You know, you've always, always wanted to write when you were a kid, etc. And then in early 2018, I attended 20 Books London. And I'd maybe written three or four books at that point, and they, they were selling, and they were doing okay. And I was so inspired by what I learned at 20 Books London in 2018 that by the time we reached November 2018, I went full-time as an author. 
there's an arrowism for you. Um, and it's very accurate because I was totally ill prepared. <laughs> uh, but it worked out in the end. So it was good. Come 2021, however, I was doing fairly good in you know, making six figures as an indie publisher with my science fiction and fantasy novels. But I was a big fan of Dungeons and Dragons and a few other things. And I'm always someone that looks out for opportunities and ways to expand my intellectual property and to you know, use the licenses to do different things and create different products, which is something I think that we should always consider as publishers is how else do I monetize my novels, right? Okay, we have um, novels, right? We have eBooks, we have audiobooks, we have different variants of the hard covers, right? We have maybe limited edition covers, leather bound, large format. So there are, there are so many different products that you can create and, and you can use your novels and, and recycle that content and create so many different products. But what about things like movie deals, uh, creating a short film, maybe doing a, an audio drama or a tabletop role playing game, things like that, comic book series, right? Graphic novels. So Kickstarter really lends itself to helping you experiment and, and maybe sidestepping some of your products into other uh, formats and, and materials, and it's truly powerful for that. So we'll talk, come back to that a little bit more towards the end. But that's what I did. Um, I got into tabletop role-playing games. I still write, write novels, and in fact, I'm focusing a lot more on that in 2024 again. Kind of did full circle, but essentially, I pivoted into Kickstarter, and by late 2020, or 2022, I'd made se uh, seven figures on Kickstarter. And I'd run maybe 20-something Kickstarters by that stage in two years. Something I do not recommend, just for the record, because <laughs> yes, I'm a little bit crazy, what can I say? But I know I'm among my friends and my people, so that's also good. And in 2023, here we are. And I, I continue to run successful Kickstarters and publish novels and all those things. So enough about me. What about you guys? What about running a six-figure Kickstarter. So obviously, we can't talk about this without mentioning Brandon Sanderson. He is mentioned all the time, and for good reason. He brought his audience along the Kickstarter recently, and he made $41.7 million in funding on Kickstarter, and that took 185,000 plus backers. And as impressive as that number is, and it's, it's very impressive, what I would like people to think about as we continue through this presentation is backers, right? Obviously, dollars are important, but you can't have the dollars without the backers. And what we see a lot of the time is people look at the, the dollar amount, 41 million, awesome. And they don't really consider, well, what about the backers? How many people did that require? And how do you get those people to, how do you motivate them to back your Kickstarter? If you think about it, if, you know, Brandon Sanderson, he has a huge following, and rightly so, he's incredibly successful. You don't need 185,000 backers. What if you take just 1% of that? Can you reach 1% of that number of backers for a fantasy series or a science fiction series or whatever it is you're trying to create? And yes, okay, this is a very specific to a genre, but if you have a big enough audience and you bring them to Kickstarter, regardless of what the genre might be, it can be incredibly successful too. Another, so, oh yeah, that's his uh, surprise, four secret novels, Brandon Sanderson, marketing genius. Um, Matt Denneman, recently, I think only last week this ended. So he has a Dungeon Crawler Carl series. Uh, he writes those under, I uh, can't remember his pen name. You're not here, Matt. Sorry? Oh, he writes under his real name. Oh, okay. Uh, so yeah, Dun Dun Dungeon Crawler Carl. He, he's built a huge audience. Um, sorry, Matt, if you're here. <laughs> uh, I haven't gotten the chance to speak to Matt this time. But Dungeon Crawler, Dungeon Crawler Carl is an incredibly successful series of books, and he released some hardcovers recently on Kickstarter, and that was incredibly successful. So he did over 300000 almost $400,000, and he got that with 4,036 backers. And Dungeon Crawler Carl, there's his, his series, and it starts with one backer. So if you notice, Brandon Sanderson, Matt Denneman, they had a certain number of backers, right? And then that will reflect 
whatever the number is in dollars. Again, we'll come back to this later. That said, those are pretty big, robust numbers, right, in terms of dollars. However, lots of us run smaller Kickstarters. The majority of my Kickstarters are not six figures. I run about one six-figure Kickstarter a year just because it's a lot of work, right? And I'll run multiple smaller Kickstarters a year as well. But it all adds up in the end. And we see a lot of indie publishers, especially in the last six to 12 months, well, the last few years, leaning on Kickstarter as an additional tool in their publishing tool set and something that they use in addition to their existing business to help support their existing business. And that's one of the great things about Kickstarter is it plugs in to what you're already doing, right? So where does it fit in with your business? Well, if you fund a new product or a project or a book or a series or whatever it might be, at the, you run your Kickstarter first, you bring your audience, they back whatever it is, then that can cover a lot of costs up front, like your editing, book cover, if you don't already have one, um, marketing, right, and a bunch of other things. So when it comes to you actually completing the book and putting it on Amazon or you know, if you're wide, wherever you're putting it, you don't have to claw back those costs. You've already covered them. So everything is, is gravy beyond that point. But it all begins with one backer. And a lot of the indie publisher projects we look at as well, they, they aren't necessarily six figures. I know a few uh, author friends who they run multiple Kickstarters a year, and they aren't six Kickstarters, but because they run multiple, it all adds up. I'm going to share three secrets to running a six-figure campaign. They're not really secrets, but it sounds fancy. Secret one, Kickstarter is not an alternative. So we can sometimes think, right, well, am I going to do it on KDP? Am I, am I going to go wide? Or am I going to do something on Kickstarter? That's not how we need to think about Kickstarter. Kickstarter is something in addition to what you are already doing. We touched on this already. You're already publishing something, right? You're already creating the product. So why not have this additional tool, this additional step in the beginning that's going to help you do that, right? Because you're doing it anyway. And this additional step can make it easier in the long run. Yes, is it more work because it's an additional step? Of course it is. And it, 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 it could be a challenge, especially early on when you're running your first few Kickstarters and you're still learning. However, once you get a system down, it becomes so much easier. Um, and the reason I can run so many different Kickstarters a year, it isn't because like, I have a magic wand or something. I wish I did. It's because I've got a process down, right? So once you've done several, you start to understand, oh, if I have, you know, I can make it more efficient if I do this and I don't do that. And you're learning your lessons and you're making it better. And when you have that process, it's easier to copy and to repeat the Kickstarters and to keep them going. Secret two, small is bigger than big. And what I mean by that is, a lot of people come to Kickstarter the first time with a big idea, right? And it's a great idea, usually. I have people reaching out to me all the time, Patty, should I do this on Kickstarter? And what do you think about that thing? And, and some of the ideas blow my mind because they're so good. And that's the problem. People try to finance or fund their big idea, the awesome thing, first on a platform they've never used before, and they don't know, that they haven't learned. So they launch the big idea on Kickstarter, and sometimes, unfortunately, it doesn't succeed as well as they had hoped because they make a bunch of mistakes. They asked for too much funding. They didn't drive enough traffic. They just didn't understand the interface of Kickstarter or the culture, and they misread a bunch of stuff, and it just didn't work out. And unfortunately, that could put a lot of people off Kickstarter, right? So what I normally say to people is, your first Kickstarter should be small, and it should not be for your big idea. It should, it should support your big idea, because you, know, you want to take the audience that you build on the small one and use it for the, the, the next big thing. An example of that would be, OK, I'm launching a new series. I'm going to write a novel. Um, I'm going to write you know, six to 12 of these things, whatever. What's, so this is a big idea. How am I going to get people interested in this? And how am I going to learn without ruining the launch of book one on Kickstarter, for example, or without failing to meet my expectations of putting me off? Right, well, why not just 
run a Kickstarter for a short story or a novella or something related to your series, right? So start small and then work your way up. And this is an example, actually. This is what I did. So at the beginning of, this is 2021, yeah. So in March 2021, my first Kickstarter funded. Um, it was called Mag of Holding Winter Wastelands, Frozen Wastelands. Um, we changed a few names around. So this wasn't going to be my first Kickstarter. I actually had a much grander idea. And I'd been working on this grand idea for six months um, toward the latter half of 2020. And I realized kind of around January, hold on a minute, you know, I've been working on this thing for a few months and it's, it's got a lot of potential to be pretty big. You know, I've, I was putting out feelers, I was going into different communities and discussing with people and, hey, do you, what do you think of this product? What do you think of this idea? Um, and that seemed to have some legs and maybe bigger legs than I expected. So I went ahead and started doing that. But then January rolled around, and I'm like, I'm getting closer to the Kickstarter and the big thing, and oh my god, I, I, I don't know what I'm doing. What am I even, why am I here? What's Kickstarter? <laughs> um, and I'd never run one before, and I got really nervous. So I didn't even know how to do something like submit the Kickstarter for approval, right? Something that's very basic now. I, I mean, I've done it 30-something times now, and it's, it's, I was joking in the panel before this, I was saying, I, I now get my kids to do it because it, you know, it's just fun to involve them. But the first time I did it, I went and I hired someone who had done a Kickstarter before to tell me what happens after I hit the approval button. That's how scared I was of it. So I was glad I ran this smaller Kickstarter. I was like, let's do something smaller. Let's do something that's, a, that's related to the bigger thing and let me make all of my mistakes, or at least a lot of my mistakes and a lot of the elementary mistakes on this smaller Kickstarter, because then I'll be better positioned to run the bigger one and for it to be more successful. So at the end of, um, was it March? Yeah, March 3rd, 2021. Uh, it did about $4,000, not too bad. Um, it actually cost me money. I think it cost me $5,000 to fulfill this. And I had actually planned that. I baked that into the project. I knew I was going to lose some money, and I was happy to do that. Something to bear in mind, if you're doing something like very new, which this was, it wasn't just novels, it was a different product, you might want to just consider that you need a little bit more outlay if you're experimenting with things. And this was an experiment. And then the next Kickstarter, which ran literally, started a few weeks after the first one, and funded in March 8th, or May 8th, 2021, brought in over six figures. And it only did that because of the first Kickstarter being small and me learning my mistakes on that, right? If I hadn't learned my mistakes there, I would have messed up a lot more on the big one and it wouldn't have made six figures. Bear in mind, I had been promoting this and working on it for six months prior to it, right? So it's not as if you can just rock up a Kickstarter, click a button, and away you go. Remember, we talked about it being all about the audience, starting with one backer. And that's one of the great things about the small Kickstarter as well, actually. If we go back to it, you see it had 274 backers. It's not a huge amount of people, but it was something. And the great thing about Kickstarter is every time you run a new project or a new campaign, all the people who backed you before, they get informed about it, right? So you're incrementally building that audience. And I think these days we have about... 16,100 and something people who have backed us in the past. And we go to them every time we have a new project, and a percentage of them will come. And as you'll see in a minute, our Kickstarters grow over time. So the next one, uh, yeah, it was six figures. I was very happy with that. Um, the next one. This is the next big one, by the way. There were a few more in between these where I experimented just to try out smaller projects, again, recycling the content trying out different licenses, different, different uh, formats and things like that. And you know, they did like 20,000, 30,000, sometimes $5,000, but it, it, it was experimental. The next big one we did was $145,000, and that was about a year later. And then this year, we had our biggest Kickstarter, which was $331,000 and 30, 
333, $333 rather. So again, six figures, and you can see that it's incrementally growing. And then the next one we have planned for next year should be $500,000 $500, plus. I need some water here. Excuse the jet lag. Is, this closed? Is what, sorry? Is this bottle? It's open. It's oh, open as well, it? yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So you can see this growing steadily over time. So one big Kickstarter, I think that's reasonable. Um, we did try doing two big Kickstarters at one point. That was a little too much. Not to say that you can't do it. Loads, loads of people do, and loads of people do really well with it. But it's just not for me. And this is just an example of much, a lot of the smaller Kickstarters, right? So uh, you can see here, the Curse of King Colin did about $7,000. Uh, the one at the bottom, the case of Normfolk did $1,794, and then a few more, right? They're ranging anywhere from $3,000 to $10,000. Secret three, starting is easy. Starting is easy. Okay, well, depends on how much you procrastinate, right? Something we all suffer from as creatives. But starting really is easy. With Kickstarter, it's, it's incredible how quickly you can submit your project for approval and get a pre-launch link. And once you have a pre-launch link, it's, it's just what you can do beyond that is incredible. So you could spend 30 minutes to 60 minutes setting up your Kickstarter account, creating a new project, going through the project, creating some placeholder stuff, placeholder image, placeholder text, submit for approval, and either it'll happen instantly or it'll go into an approval process where it has to happen annually over like three or four days. Sometimes it can take a week, it just depends. But it's that easy. You could spend 60 minutes doing that. And you don't have to have your page, see, that's just, this is the thing some people think, is you, you, you need to have the story page and the sales page, whatever you want to call it, all finished before you submit it for approval. You don't. As long as you have enough information on there for, for the person who's going to review that to look at it and go, okay, you know, they are publishing something in the publishing category. Is that what's in this page? Yeah. And they'll approve it. And once you get that approval, you can change everything after that if you want to. You can improve it, you can refine it. And you, so you're not stuck with anything apart from uh, a URL thing which doesn't really matter at that early on in the stage. So you can get your pre-launch page. And once you have a pre-launch page, it, consider it as like a pre-order page on Amazon, right? You can start sending people to that sales page and they'll start buying into it, right? Only on Kickstarter, they don't purchase anything. They'll click a follow button. And the reason this is incredibly powerful is because the bigger that number, the bigger the chances of your Kickstarter campaign being incredibly successful once you launch it. So it could be a really good indicator as to what that success is going to be. Now, what that is will depend on so many variables. We can't really go into it in detail right now. But essentially, you'll take your tiers. Let's say you have one to five tiers, and the first one is an ebook, and the fifth one is a special edition leather bound, signed. $120 or something, limited edition, I don't know, just making this stuff up. And then in the middle somewhere, you go your average pledge is going to be maybe $35, $40. So what you can then do is go, well, how many followers do I have? Take 10% of those and multiply those by the average tier. And again, this isn't accurate, so don't be going away and going, Patty, I did this calculation and it didn't work out the way I expected it to, but it's a good rule of thumb that if you can convert 10% of the followers, which is actually very conservative, um, it's very usual for the followers on your Kickstarter to convert a, a closer to 20 to 30%. But if, even just the 10%, you can go, okay, well now I know if, it's, if, if there's gonna be, let's say you have 1,000 followers and 10% of those is 100, and they're gonna back me on maybe day one or in the, in the first 48 hours, and it's $35, well, you've, you've got, well, that's how much I could expect in the first two days. So this is incredibly powerful because the bigger that follow, follower number is, the bigger the Kickstarter is going to be. So what if you had 5,000 people following your page 
and 20% of that, or 10% of that is, is a lot more, right? What if you had 10,000 people following? Then you have 1,000 people backing you in the first 48 hours. And then you will gather more momentum, and that will carry you at a higher level across the duration of the campaign, whether that's 30 days, or you, know, you could be doing something more experimental, which is seven to 10 days. Depends on what you're doing. Audience is key. I keep saying this because it is all about the audience. That's why I talk so much about the follower number, because that indicates how much audience you're going to have, right? This is why I keep talking about the backer number, because when you finish a Kickstarter, you have those backers. That's, a, that's an additional number that you can add on to the next campaign. Starts with one backer. And one backer starts with one follower. So the following, gathering the followers, having the pre-launch page, that's something I see a lot of first Kickstarters, or even people who are a little later in their Kickstarter career, they skip it. And that's really unfortunate because it's like a big red button that can make it go boom, right? Why would you not want the big red button that make, to make it go boom? So what I would suggest to people is to start now. We'll start talking in the Q&A in a second. You can ask a few questions, but start now. And I mean right now. If you have a notepad, write down when you can spend one hour doing your first Kickstarter. If you've already done a bunch of Kickstarters, when you can do the next Kickstarter. And what I want you to do is go, OK, I could dedicate one hour next week when I get home or whenever it might be. Try to do it as soon as possible. Because when you get home, you know, things will happen. You'll get sidetracked. And take that hour to just go through the application process or setting up your first project or your next project if you've already run a project. And get that, get that pre-launch page as soon as possible, right? You'll get that pre-launch page. And if you have three months then, or six months even better, to promote your Kickstarter campaign, and you just keep driving traffic to the pre-launch page and your follower count goes up and up and up, you'll, you'll see when you launch that Kickstarter that it will have a huge impact on the campaign and on what you can expect in terms of the number of dollars and the number of total backers. And the great thing about Kickstarter as well is you have access to all the data. You have access to how many people backed you and what day they did it on and all that stuff, the stuff you don't see on Amazon and some other retailers. You also have direct access to all of your backers. Kickstarter essentially is direct sales in a way, right? Soft direct sales, let's call it that, because you're still using someone else's platform, but you have access to everything. You can email these people. You can ask them to fill in a survey. You can send them to another product, etc. So Q&A, any questions? Yes, please come up to the microphone. And if we line up, it'll help me know how many people are going to be, if, if you can, and sort of manage the time a little bit. So go ahead. Um, so I've seen other people who have sort of done numerous Kickstarters without reaching that sort of six-figure level. So from your experience, what would you say is, I don't know, the, the, um, the thing that's kind of tipped you, other than the, the longevity and the building of the audience, what have you, what is it that makes the difference between one of those big six-figure Kickstarters and those small ones? Great question. So it all comes back to audience, right? If you have built up the audience and you're consistent as well in maintaining familiarity with your audience and building your own personal brand and they become aware of you and they want to invest in you because they see you're doing something and it's new and it's exciting, that, that can be a huge factor. So oh, number one, obviously, the, the more people you have, the better. But also, how do you engage with those people while you have them to make sure that when they convert, to use a really clinical term, um, that it's not 5%, it's 30%, or it's higher. So, so when you're saying engaging, do you mean like in between campaigns, like if you've got them on your newsletter, or like the backer updates, that kind of thing? Exactly. Backer updates are a great way to do it. 
and make sure every update you, you write has a call to action that will feed them into another funnel or it doesn't even have to be another funnel. It's just like, hey, here's another thing about me. Go check it out. I think you'll like it. And they start to build a relationship with you, right? So like I said, the first six-figure Kickstarter I did, one of the major contributing factors was I started promoting it six months before. Yes, that helped me build a bigger follower, following number, but it helped people get to know me over six months. I went from being a nobody in the community, I'm still nobody in the, in the community, but people were, you know, they, they got to know me. They were like, oh yeah, it's you again, you're posting another thing, and hey, how are you doing? And you know, being just casual with people and not just going to them with, you know, go back my thing, or just contributing stuff. Like I would often go, go into a, a community and go, hey, I've, I've got this, these two ideas and I'm not sure which one to do, what do you guys think? And I would get lots of people, and, and because, you're valuing them and their opinion and things like, you know, you're building that relationship. And you do that over six months. When they see that you are doing the thing, you don't really need to even ask them. They'll go, oh, you know, you're one of my people. I'm going to go do the thing with you. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Hi. Um, I had two, like, unrelated questions. One is, is there an ideal duration for the program? And the second one's a little bit meatier. Um, is, you know, given the fact that you're raising hundreds of thousands of dollars and, you know, books can lead to TV series and movies, is there any, like, situation where there are repercussions in that, like, you raise $500,000 and you turn around and made a $10 million movie uh, two years later and your, your backers are all pissed off at you? <laughs> <laughs> um, quick question. So to answer the first part, how long? What's the duration? So that depends. So what I often say to people is when you run the first Kickstarter, if you haven't done one before and it's, it's small and you're learning from your, your mistakes and you, know, you don't want to invest too much in it, I often recommend that that's like 10 days long. Because you don't want to be running, waiting 30 days when you've learned the, most of the lessons in the first few days, right? And then you're just languishing for the rest of the time. And there's not a lot happening and it can be very, you know, it could, put you on a, bit, on a bit of a negative headspace because nothing's happening for, you know, I've had meters mistakes, yada, yada. So it depends on what you're doing, what's your goal. If you're just learning, yeah, if you're experimenting, also keep them quite short. But the general rule of thumb is if you're doing a kind of robust campaign, is 30 days. So 30 days of the campaign from start to finish. And what I would say is, um, I like to say that the second most important date of your Kickstarter is the first day because you're launching your product, right? Or you're launching your campaign. The most important day is every day before that because you're, that's when you're building all of the momentum. And then when you hit go, that momentum has to carry you for those 30 days. And you'll see most of your conversions and your backers pledging in the first 48 hours and the last 48 hours. And there are lots of things you can do in the middle to raise those numbers, but um, that's the duration. The second part was yes and no. Um, as long as you fulfill your promises to those backers, so for example, if you told them you were going to give them something, if you give it to them, they'll be happy, right? So if you're going to go do the same thing and you give the same thing to a bunch of people later for more money or fun or whatever, like, that's fine because you've already fulfilled your promise with them. And do you know what? They will actually help you celebrate that success because they were part of the creation of the thing. And that's the thing we need to think, remember when it comes to backers is their behavior isn't such that, hey, I'm shopping. Um, and and this, this isn't true of everyone, obviously. Some people do use Kickstarter as a storefront and they shop for products and whatnot. But usually it's people who are like, you know, I, I don't have time to write a novel, right? I'm probably never gonna get around to writing a novel, but there's an author and they're writing a new novel. I wanna be part of their journey. I wanna contribute to them because I'm being part of something greater than I am, right? So you'll find that some backers, many backers actually, which we have found is they just keep coming back because they keep wanting to be part of something that's bigger than them. And if you expand on that, that, that gets them excited. And you are going to get a few people, naysayers, haters, whatever, who aren't happy no matter what you do. I would just say ignore them. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Um, I also have two questions, but uh, the first one is how do you um, input like cost of shipping, like if you're doing an international physical good, goods? Do you, I've seen some Kickstarters do it after it's funded. I've seen some include it in the price, so. What do you I use would say this? after, mm -hmm. yeah. Use something like Backerkit, okay. Pledge Manager, mm -hmm. and use that to collect funding okay. for the shipping side of things. Because number one, 
EIS helps you collect the funds mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason that's important is because you don't know what's going to happen with shipping rates. Mm -hmm. when, when you run your Kickstarter, it might take you three to six months to fulfill it first sure. time round, right? The shipping rates might not be the same. Mm -hmm. And we, we were hurt really badly by this during COVID because, you know, shipping went times 10 mm -hmm. because shipping containers couldn't go anywhere, right? So if you do the pledge, uh, the get, get, collect the shipping later, there's that, but also it gives you a second opportunity to introduce people to more stuff. So once you're paying for your shipping, hey, what about this other series I've written? Here's another ebook. here's another product. Oh, okay. So That's smart. Okay, cool. No problem. Um, and then uh, let's say I'm thinking about doing a Kickstarter for like a sequel in a series, right? Obviously, you're bringing people over that enjoyed the first book. Um, how would you... Uh, bring on people who may not have read the first book. Would you include like the first one as? Yeah, yeah. just create, just include the first one. Yeah. Um, and you can go tier one, book one. Okay. Tier two, book one and two, plus, or or however many books you have in the series, mm -hmm. right? But then it gives people an opportunity to go. Oh, I only want one book because I've never read this person's work before. Mm -hmm. Boom, I've read it. Okay, now I'll go invest in the other stuff. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I'm new to Kickstarter. Haven't run a campaign yet, but I'm looking at doing one with. Perhaps an ebook and print in the future. Uh, what, I'm curious what your recommendation would be as far as making that available later in another platform, Amazon or, or so on. Trying to keep a window where we, it's still exclusive to Kickstarter so that the backers don't see it available two months down the line for you know, $3.99 or whatever. Uh, what would you recommend as far as not to do that or what would be a good length of time to? Great question. So I'll, I'll be, I'm going to be very quick because we're running out of time. But essentially, um, there are two different audiences, first of all. So people who are backing on, on K, are buying KDP books aren't necessarily going to go to Kickstarter. right? So they're very different. And like I said, their behaviors are different. One, one wants to invest in something greater than themselves and be part of a, a journey. The other wants to buy a product. right? Um, as long as you aren't selling exclusivity, that's fine. What I would do is make sure when you are creating your tiers that you bake in like a, a discount to people who are backing you on Kickstarter because they are helping you create something from nothing. You just have an idea and they're, 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 there's no guarantee they're going to get the thing, but they're actually going to the trouble and the risk of going, hey, take some of my money with the hope that you will do it. And, and that's, that's a huge thing for those people and you kind of don't want to not reward them for that trust because that's, that's incredible. So give them a discount, obviously, and then whenever it comes to the actual product, sell it at whatever the retail price is. Okay. That's Thank just you. one way to get around it. Thanks. You're welcome. Hi, this is a question from online audience. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on if there is an ideal number of stretch goals, more or fewer? Um, well, this is a really broad question. The more, the better, essentially. But you also, you wanna, I want to tamper that with don't do too many and overpromise and underdeliver. So especially in the beginning, you want your stretch goals to be closer together because you want to get a lot of buzz going in the first few days, right? So you might want to design it as such that you unlock like a few stretch goals each day for the first two days. And then anything after that, it can kind of be whenever, right? Um, but you can also introduce stretch goals later on as the campaign progresses. You don't have to have them all ready to go on the first day. So you can react to, oh, what's happening, right? Because you don't want to, um, I was talking to Kevin J. Anderson about this before. You don't want to have like, on, I don't know, let's say like 12 um, stretch goals. And then the Kickstarter was a lot more successful than you expected it to be, and it unlocks them all right away. And then you're like, oh my, what, what else am I going to do, right? So you can react, have, have a rough idea going in, and have, build on some flexibility. I hope that helps. Next question, please. All right, just um, real quick. I'm uh, a new writer, published my first thriller novel. And uh, I've been following Kickstarter because I like to follow tech stuff for a long time. Um, and have you know done my little piece of funding, yours and a few others. <laughs> uh, but I don't see a lot of pure contemporary thrillers, if any, on Kickstarter. Science fiction and fantasy, you can make little dragons and you can make swords and all sorts of crazy wonderful stuff that they can get. I mean, we did the Brandon Sanderson thing for our kids and they got all sorts of stuff for Christmas that was Brandon Sanderson Kickstarter stuff. But I don't have a clue what to do that direction in the thriller world, contemporary thriller. Yeah. What I would say here is each genre is going to be different on Kickstarter, right? So that's what you're saying. Now, 
were there a lot of people who, who bought in the fantasy novels on Kickstarter when Van Sanderson came along? No, he made that, yeah. he made that happen. So you kind of, unfortunately at the minute, someone's going to do this for each genre, right? It's going to happen. It hasn't happened with all of them. I, one of the things I'll say is you could be that person, right? You could build the audience and bring them along for the ride. So that, that's, that's a much bigger thing to try to accomplish. I get that. But unfortunately, it, it, it isn't set up for every genre. But the thing is, if you get in now and start doing things and, and that person does come along, then you will be part of that journey as well. So, yeah. So, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, we've run out of time, actually. But what I will do is, once I've finished, I'll come down. And if you guys want, still want to ask questions, I'm very happy to, to do that. But yes, thank you. you're very welcome. So thank you so much for coming. Um, you can find me at pattyfin.com. Um, and I do have a Kickstarter course I will be launching at the 1st of January. And you can sign up to the newsletter there and stay posted on that if you're interested in doing so. Have a great time. <laughs>